Hello everybody, and welcome to Game of Thrones Power Rankings, a new feature coming from my Movie Mammoth channel. Every episode I'll be changing up and breaking down the episode and see how it affected the power rankings. Uh, I'm going to start with the top 20, and obviously all of the characters in Game of Thrones can't make this list, so this really is just a top 20. I wouldn't say best characters, I would say most powerful. It's sort of a combination of powerful as well as how evil they are. Really, whatever reason they have to be on screen, how effective they are at portraying that, how much they can get things done. Uh, for a lot of these King's Landing characters, it's how much control they have or how much they've been able to do without being killed themselves. Uh, some of these are primarily fighters, but I tried to I tried to weigh it out as evenly as I could based on all of these different parameters and let's go ahead and see what we've got starting with number 20. Now this was a very hard pick. I had to compile which character would get in as the very last one in with so many other characters rearing to get into these power rankings. I had to go with recency and I had to go with Samwell Tarly. We learned a lot about Sam this episode. We got to see where he comes from, and oh my gosh. I knew he was from a noble family, but I had no idea it was this noble. I mean, he is loaded. It was great to see his sister and mother. They were just the most nice, charming women he could ever imagine. Absolutely the opposite of his father. I mean, oh my god, talk about an asshole. After that scathing dinner sequence in which Sam just had to keep his mouth shut so that he could keep Gilly safe under his father's roof, I was really not feeling Sam so much, but right when I thought the scene was about to end, he came back and he changed his mind. I don't know exactly what his plan is for Gilly since Old Town still can't really take women or babies in. I don't know if he's going to hide them or whatnot, but I really loved that he just didn't want to get separated because him and Gilly are easily one of the best couples on the show. I mean, they far outweigh Grey Worm and that slave girl who I don't even know the name of. I don't, I, it can't even compare. So it really was great to see him make that decision himself that he didn't want to get split up. And then to top it all off, he decides he might as well pocket Great Spain on the way out of there. I mean, oh my gosh, even as he did it, I'm saying, Sam, don't do this, don't do this, and Gilly's like, what's he gonna do? He's gonna try and come back and get his sword, and Sam's like, let him try. I mean, good God, Sam, your dad is gonna murder you. He already just despised you, now you're gonna shit on his name and take the sword of his family? Baller move, huge power move, it's the reason he's in these top 20 this week, he definitely wouldn't have been otherwise. But, I mean, there's got to be some serious repercussions for that. I am glad to see that Sam got another Valerian Steel weapon, though, because he's going to need those when those walkers come down. He's going to become really important because he's going to be nose deep in those books and hopefully be, can be the one person who can find a weakness to these White Walkers. So, number 19, we have Bran Stark. This was a tough one for me. I almost didn't want to put him on the list at all because I'm still pretty salty over the whole Hodor thing. But to be honest, this episode we got a lot of really cool visions from Bran. First of all, he learned a lot of the history he's missed since he left Westeros. And we got a lot of new stuff, a lot of past stuff with Ares the Mad King and the Kingslayer doing the deed that he's named for. Uh, as well as some possible future stuff involving some wildfire. We're going to have to keep our eyes on that. The real thing that Bran has over a lot of these other characters and what might keep him on the list for weeks to come is his ability to go into the past. I mean, without him, we would have never had that fantastic double sword fight at the Tower of Joy. We wouldn't get to see some of these younger Ned flashbacks or the explanation of why Hodor is Hodor. A lot of really cool stuff, probably more cool stuff, that we're going to see from Bran. So for that alone, I have to put him in here, especially now that he's teamed up with our number 18, Benjen Stark, a.k.a. Coldhands. Benjen is back. He's been gone pretty much the entire show. I mean, he was in the show for maybe one or two episodes, and this is his third episode. I love the makeup on him. I love the explanation for how he died and was sort of revived back. And I'm really excited to see what else he can do because that opening action sequence where he comes in with the flaming mace, oh my gosh, 
This guy's awesome. I want more. I need way more. He's on the list on his first week back because he's just that awesome, but this guy can climb. At number 17, everybody's favorite wildling since Egret died, Tormen Giantsbane. This dude is a straight up baller. First of all, he has some of the great action sequences in Game of Thrones history. He got to beat the hell out of the Lord of Bones last season. And he's pretty much Jon Snow's second in command for this army of this war that's about to be coming. But most importantly, he and Brienne are just beautiful together. I love, he's only had really two facial interactions with her and they've both just been so tormented, just so great. I mean, you get so much just out of his face and his reactions. They haven't even talked yet, but this is my most requested romance on the show. I can't wait, and I want this. I want this to happen, you guys. Moving up to number 16, another Stark. We have Sansa Stark. Now, originally I had Sansa a lot higher on this list, but I realized that was mostly recency bias because I started remembering her in season 1 and 2 and 3, and four and five and now I'm really starting to like what Sansa's having ever since she reunited with John she's really been able to have some real agency she's not listening to Littlefinger she's teamed up with Brienne so she has some some fight with her I mean I really love that it was her telling John and trying to convince him to go back and take Winterfell because he was just completely taking the pacifist route since he came back from the dead which is understandable and she's like no there's a monster in our home we have to do this we're gonna go rally all the people in the north all the smaller houses to our cause. I'm going to do this with or without you. So Sansa's really rising in my eyes. I really like what she's been doing this season and really ever since she jumped off the walls of Winterfell. Next up is the Conqueror, Daenerys Targaryen. I'm not going to say the rest of her titles. We get enough of that shit in the show and I can't handle any more of it. Now, to be totally honest with you guys, I do not like Daenerys very much anymore. I really was on board with her first season, halfway through the second season, especially the third season when she had that great moment where she tricked the Slave Master and took all of those Unsullied with her. But that moment was really one of her last great moments until this season. She spent a lot of time just sitting in Marine and fucking everything up, and now all the slave cities have taken back everything outside of Marine. But this season, she's gone back to her roots. She's gone back to the Dothraki. She did that same little language trick again with the Dothraki, which was fine, I guess. But she burned down the whole call hut. That was insane. That was awesome. And it got the Dothraki on her side. This week, we got pretty much the same thing again, but she's on a dragon this time. Which I always, I always like seeing Drogon. He looks really awesome. He's really grown a lot, and he looks like he could really take down some towers when he gets over to Westeros now. But, unfortunately, this is kind of just more of the same from Daenerys. I mean, her M.O. is basically, I name my names, and I do speeches. And people, they will bow down to me, or they hate me. It's either, it's either they love me or they hate me every time they see me. Right now we're in the love side, so that's pretty good. But hopefully she can actually get across that frickin' ocean that I've been waiting for since season three, and then we can really see what she's got in her bag of tricks. I will say that the one part of this episode I really liked about her, and something I've heard swirling around on the internet lately, is that this could be the start of her as a villain. And I kind of love that. I mean, I'm already really not rooting for her. And once she gets over to Westeros, there's so many other people over there that I'd rather root for than some lady who just has a dragon cheat code. So I think she fits the bill of a villain. She's got madness in her blood. She loves conquering. She's got a bunch of rape into Thraki. And she makes a ton of mistakes and stumbles over herself, like most villains do when they eventually lose. I really like what she could do, and I'm interested to see where they take her character from here. Hopefully they get the other two dragons out of that frickin' dungeon eventually, and we can really get some good stuff from her. Moving up past Daenerys is another strong female character who has some similarities with Daenerys. She can use her sexuality to her advantage at times, but that's kind of where the similarities end between them, because next up is Marjorie Tyrell, and she is just 
levels ahead of Daenerys, especially in manipulation. She handles Tommen like a newborn puppy. It's embarrassing. I'm really excited to see her and the Sparrow go toe-to-toe -to -toe because after this week especially, those two are pretty much in charge of King's Landing now. Well, if Marjorie is actually playing the long game and has something in mind, which I'm really hoping she does, because otherwise she just kind of gave away the keys to the castle. So this is a tentative 14. We'll have to see how the rest of the season goes. This move could propel her up a bunch with some good payoff or completely drop her off the map. We'll have to see. But I do like that she's had some time away from all the riches and the dresses and she can kind of recollect herself and, and replan all on her own. She knows it's just her because Loras has kind of fallen apart. And she can use she can use Elena Tyrell. I mean, she clearly can't use the other Tyrell. So I'm excited to see, you know, maybe they'll reveal a little bit more about what her plan is because she better have one, let's just say that. Right above Marjorie, we have our first true villain, Ramsey Bolton. Now I'm clearly not raking this on how much I like the guy, but you gotta admit, he gets stuff done. It might be kinda messy the way he murdered his father in his own home to take control of his, his whole home, but he still did it. And you know this guy is pretty great at warfare. I mean, he took out Stannis Baratheon. Now granted, Stannis was clearly in a funk at that point, but still, this guy can lead raiding parties like no other. He's very sadistic. He's a great villain within the context of Game of Thrones, especially after what happened with Sansa last year. I'm really excited to see what's gonna happen in this bastard bowl in this battle for the North, but right now, I mean, Ramsey is just peak Ramsey right now. He's killing all sorts of people. He doesn't care, and he just wants to take control of everything. And right now, he certainly has the ability to do that. We'll just have to see what the Starks have planned for him in the future. Right above Ramsey, another villain, but one who is clearly got some more backing behind him than Ramsey, the Night's King. Especially after some recent episodes with Hodor and the entire annihilation of the Three-Eyed Raven's little hovel, this guy is stepping up his game. He's already got a ton of whites and a ton of zombies at his back, not to mention he's got all these White Walker generals. And now the big game, he got part of Bran's arm. He's got that magic on him. So does this magic affect the wall? If Bran goes south of the wall, is that going to tear the wall down? We'll see, but that would be a huge move for the Night's King. But this guy's already got a huge army. He's got immortality on his side. He's just waiting. I mean, the children of the forest are eradicated? I'm not quite sure, but they can't be that high in numbers because the White Walkers definitely have them outnumbered. He's just waiting. He's just playing the waiting game at this point, but I guarantee you, when he strikes, it's going to be hard to turn him back. They've only got like half a dozen Valerian swords and like some Children of the Forest spears, which they probably don't even have anymore. So this guy is definitely moving on up, especially after the havoc he wreaked at Hardhome last season. Oh my gosh. One of the best scenes in Game of Thrones, and he was the leader of all that stuff. Gotta give the man props. Right above the Night's King, we get back to some good old Stark. Arya Stark, ladies and gentlemen. Now, Arya Stark's in a kind of weird spot after this most recent episode. We've seen her for at least a season do this many-faced god's assassin training, learning how to fight with a stick, becoming Daredevil, doing all sorts of, you know, covert operations. But this week, she decided, nah, I'm not going to kill that super nice actress lady because... I am actually Arya Stark. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I never really believed she thought she was no one. But then again, the Waif clearly isn't no one, because she's got a freaking huge personality on her and has a huge grudge against Arya, which hopefully we'll be able to see play out in the future. But anyways, Arya is clearly one of the best characters in this series. Longevity alone, the things she's been through and the things she's done, I'm really excited to see what she's gonna see, but... Hey, you can't beat Arya Stark and Needle, I'll tell you that right now. And may hey, maybe she'll be heading over to Westeros soon, too. We might get even more Stark family reunions. Everyone loves those, eh? Here we go now. This is the first of our top ten. And at number ten, we have Elena Tyrell. She really is one of the most cunning and smart political maneuverers in King's Landing. 
and the whole South. Now, clearly she ain't going to win no trial by combat if she's the one doing the combat. But you can guarantee that she knows how to get herself in a position with the most chances to win. I mean, she was very close to getting Marjorie out of that walk of shame and getting back her king and king this week before Marjorie kind of turned the tables on her and changed her and changed the whole plan. But, I mean, she still had a plan in place. That's what's important. And she is clearly the head of the household of the Tyrells. I mean, you really going to trust Mace Tyrell? The dude has five feathers on his hat, and he doesn't even need a hat. You can't trust that guy. you got to give props to her alone for getting her family into a position where they are now have the queenship of the realm, and they have opportunities to continue their reign for years to come. And although she didn't plan it, Marjorie kind of learns from her, and Marjorie has turned the tables and taken Tommen away from both Jamie and Cersei, so at least a little props for that, and Elena Martell is the first in our top ten. Not to mention, she is just awesome and speaks her mind like no other character does, making jokes and saying things that you don't think anyone would, taking Sans aside when she's the only one there in King's Landing. I mean, you really gotta love her and I'd love to see her team up with some other people soon. I mean, you really gotta give props to a lady who can do all of that badassery while fanning herself in a chair by the gardens. Next up, we have another lovely lady, but this one is a fighter, Brienne of Tarth. Now, she's amazing. She's had a great run. I loved her start with Jamie in the second season, and it sounds like in the future we might get a little reunion from them in River Run, so I'm pretty friggin' excited for that. But right now, I'm really into the, her entire relationship or non-relationship with Tormund. I can't wait to see where that goes. But the real important thing is that she's finally found someone to serve. She had so long just watching that candle last season. Such a waste, but it's nice to see that it did pay off. Because her and Sansa are now working together. Which, thank God. Sansa needs Brienne. And Brienne needs Sansa, so it's really great to see them work together. Brienne is amazing. I kind of can't wait to see who she's going to fight next because she's unstoppable. She had a great scene at the beginning of this season where she took out all of Ramsay's men and their dogs just ran off because I would too. Brienne is a badass. And speaking of badass fighters, Baron the Sellsword comes in at number eight. Now this is just one of my personal favorite characters on the show. The guy is witty. The guy can fight great. And he has great lines, and he actually has some great people he can show his screen time with. Everything he has with Tyrion is fantastic. I really wish that they could get back together at some point. That's one of my favorite relationships. It's not even sexual on the show. Bronn is fantastic, though. I mean, without him, we would not have Tyrion right now. We just wouldn't. Just simply put. He teaches Jamie how to fight. He's done so much for the show. And it's a travesty that he hasn't been mentioned this entire season. But we did get a name drop this episode, so hopefully he's going to come back soon because he can leave his mark wherever and whenever he wants. Just give him enough gold and he'll get the job done. Speaking of fighters, again, or more like old fighters who now can't fight at all because they've got a golden hand, it's Jamie Lannister. Now, first off, I want to say, why does he still have a golden hand? You're telling me freaking Kyburn can bring back the mountain as the crazy zombie guy, but he can't make some kind of sword hand for Jamie on his right hand so he can be badass again? I've been waiting too long for this. He's completely inept at fighting now, and it doesn't have to be that way. But regardless of whether or not he's going to get a sword hand, he's still a great character. Do you remember when we hated him in Season 2? He was a pretty boy douchebag who was trying to kill all our favorite people. But now by this point, we've seen so much from him. He's gone through so much. He's lost a hand. He's lost a lot of children. He's lost a lot of his sister's love, although they kind of rekindled it this episode, which was fantastic to see. But now he's getting back to basics. He's getting back to leading armies, which he's great at, unless it's against Rob Stark. So we should be able to see some real cool stuff from him in River Run. And you know the dude always looks great. He always has the best armor on, and... Is just hands down one of the best characters on the screen. I mean, last episode, that horse up the stairs alone got him in this top ten. I mean, <laughs> I've never seen that before, and that was just amazing. 
He had much anger too when he realized they'd taken Tommen from him. This guy, this character has really grown since the beginning of the show, and I just think he's fantastic. I can't wait to see more from him. Speaking of incest, in comes Cersei Lannister at number six. Now Cersei has been behind much, much, much of the political maneuvering in the King's Landing since the very beginning. A lot of people thought she's the one who had Jon Arryn killed. It turns out no, but she is the one who kind of had King Robert killed. So that's pretty impressive. But uh, incest aside, she really is a great character. Now she does have her vices like her brother, and she does have her other vices like wanting to kill her other brother, but you can't really blame her, especially once we heard that prophecy in season 5. This is a woman who only wants to keep her children alive, even though she knows she's kind of fighting a losing battle. And she will do anything for her children. Her face when Joffrey died was just pure anguish. I mean, you can really feel for her. And she really did feel like she had everything in control. I mean, after Tywin died, she was the only person left in charge of really the Lannisters, with Jaime off the Dorne last season, and Tommen being the most stupid king ever to rule the land. And she felt like she was doing a good job. She even had a little militia on the side until she underestimated somebody. A mistake that she's probably not going to make again. Because that mistake led to the walk of shame. Something that almost broke her. She clearly didn't learn much from being locked up in those dungeons for so long. Other than, I am going to burn this place to the ground. And she didn't quite get her way last episode, but the way she sat there calmly while Jamie freaked out and then she gave him the affection he needed to go and win that castle back really shows me that she's already thinking about three or four steps ahead. She's got a cool head and she knows what she has to do to burn it all to the ground. So starting off our top five here was pretty difficult to start with, but... I mean, it's Littlefinger. What am I going to say, you guys? He's been behind so much of the show, killing John Aaron, killing Joffrey. Like, he's done so much, and nobody knows he's doing it. He's in the shadows the whole time. He is just above Cersei here because he's been kind of playing Cersei recently. I mean, she didn't know that he married off Sansa Stark. He's the one who kind of convinced her to let him go up to the north with the Knights of the Vale, which you know he's only going to use for his own personal gain, but he still made it seem like he was doing it for her, which makes me think she hasn't really caught on to him yet, and that's why he had to put Littlefinger above her. Now, we haven't got much from him this season other than the fact that he had to talk to Sansa, and she called him out about a lot of his bullshit, but he did give her important information about the Blackfish and River Run, so... We'll have to see where he goes from here, but I guarantee you, he already has a plan, and he's going to make a ladder out of that chaos and climb it all the way to the top if he can. And just above Littlefinger at number four is the man who has made the biggest power play almost in the history of Game of Thrones. It's the Sparrow. This guy's barely been in the show for not even two seasons, and he's already one of the three most powerful people in King's Landing. He's made this agreement with Tom and Marjorie to where now the religious people are one of the two towers of King's Landing's ability to rule. I mean, he went from a guy in rags at a soup kitchen in the streets, maybe, I mean, to being the ruler of everybody practically. Tommen is a pushover, so really, it's just him and Marjorie at the top right now. And this guy's a master manipulator. It's honestly scary, because I know that he's not telling the truth, but I don't know what his truth is. I don't know what his end game is. I don't know where he wants to go or what he wants to do, but he's getting there fast, and it's scary. So I had to put him at the top here, because he really... He, he already got one over on Cersei. Littlefinger's not even in town, so he's already created this whole thing where he's almost more powerful than Littlefinger now. And it's going to be interesting to see where he goes from here because so far, he has outplayed everyone that's walked up to him. And maybe it's only Marjorie that can outplay him because she seems to be playing along with his game so far. But we'll just have to see because right now the Sparrow is in charge of King's Landing. Here we go, heading into the top three. At number three, Jon Snow. Come on, you guys. I couldn't put him out of anywhere near the top five, especially after this season's events where he came back from the dead. 
He's just too important to the entire show. I've loved a lot of what he's been involved with, everything north of the wall. He's learning a lot about the horrors that are to come, and he's one of the only people who can really stop those evil White Walkers from coming south of the wall, even though he's not at the wall right now, and he's rallying troops all around the north to take back his home. Because everything in the north is going to be just as important as that wall. Especially if some kind of magic leads to the thing just melting anyways. You're going to need to be able to stop them right there. Because everyone south of the neck doesn't really believe in White Walkers. I mean, we saw it with Sam's family where they were just snickering at him because he said he killed a White Walker. People don't know how much trouble they're in. And Jon Snow is one of the few people who can actually save them. Another thing that I really loved about Jon this season... Not only his reunion with Sansa, which is fantastic and is really promising for the future, but the moment where he had to cut through the wire and kill Ollie and Alistair Thorne and the other mutineers, you could really see a lot of emotion on his face. He didn't want to do it. He was so sad. It was old John. And then he just turned, and he was just angry, and, and he just watched them squirm as they died, and he could not give a flying F about it. And then the dude just straight bounces from the wall. I mean, he's making huge decisions all over the place. Even though he didn't quite leave the wall that episode, I'm really excited to see what he's going to do. Right now, John is safely in the top three, and it's going to be pretty hard to knock him much lower than anywhere near the top five for episodes to come. But we'll just have to see, because this guy is one of the only people standing between the Night's King and Westeros right now, and he better stay there. So here we are with the final two. At number two might be kind of surprising to some people, but it's Varys the Spider. This guy is the opposite of Littlefinger. He's out for the good of the realm, not just himself, but he's just as powerful as Littlefinger, especially in this so-called Shadow War that has been going on between them for seasons. I mean, he really is one of the few things that kept Westeros afloat for a long time. He was the one talking to Ned Stark in the dungeons. He helped Tyrion escape from Westeros because he trusted him enough and knew that he would be important in the future. And now he's coming over to Daenerys' side, and him and Tyrion are one of the best buddy cops in the nation. And now that they're with Daenerys, it really makes her claim to the throne hard to stop because before she had the conquering, she had the names, she had a lot of what she needed, but she didn't have somebody who knew the land, who knew the people, who could rally the troops and the families around her when she actually broke ground on Westeros. And now she does with Tyrion and with Varys, and Varys especially. Varys has been a key cog in the works of King's Landing since the beginning. And who knows how much power he really wields. I mean, we've never truly seen the extent of it. But he's a master manipulator, and he gets his job done, no matter what. So, I mean, it's pretty hard to say anything bad about the guy. Granted, he's not the best fighter, and we don't know that much about him, but he gets his job done. And that's what's most important in the land of Game of Thrones. You gotta play that game, and you don't want to get caught. And he hasn't gotten caught yet. And I don't think he will for seasons to come. Not to mention in the, in the most recent episodes when he was talking to the Red Priestess over in Marine. I mean, we got some real intriguing stuff about his past and about whether or not magic might have been involved in his whole eunuch situation. It'll be interesting to see if that pays off, but just watching him act in that scene alone was just fantastic. I mean, the guy is just nailing it, and I can't wait to see more from him. But now on to our number one pick. And at number one, you already knew, I already knew, I started with this one when I made the power rankings. It's Tyrion frickin' Lannister. The guy is the best. He's probably the one character who if he died, I would seriously consider stop watching the show because he's just so amazing. I mean, to quote him, he drinks and he knows things. And I love both of those things in Game of Thrones. The guy is a master manipulator. He's not quite as good as Varys, I would say, but he can get out of pretty much any situation just by using his mouth, even by using the, the tantalizing prospect of selling a dwarf cock, which he has before and hopefully will in the future. He's been one of the best characters since the beginning. He's almost sort of a comic relief, 
but he's also incredibly intelligent. He saved everyone at the Battle of Blackwater Bay. I mean, Peter Dinklage really does kill it in this. Just the scene of him in the courtroom alone is enough to put him in the top five, but the guy has so many fantastic moments, especially in that season. I mean, he has to go and choke out Shay right after that and kill his father. I mean, not to mention he was blamed for the death of Joffrey, and that's why Cersei wants to kill him so badly. Well, one of many reasons. Cersei is a whole other bag of tricks. Tyrion's on the top of the world right now. And now he's working for Daenerys. He's made a proposition to the Slave Masters, which should be interesting to see how it plays out, because this might be one of the first backfires Tyrion's had to deal with, and that could knock him out of the top spot. But for right now, the guy is locked down in that Iron Throne at the top of our power rankings. And it's going to be tough to unseat him. It is going to be tough. Thank you guys for watching. That was my power rankings based on the current standings of Game of Thrones as of Season 6, Episode 6. Full spoilers for Game of Thrones, guys. I don't know how to talk about it without spoiling. I'll be back next week to update these power rankings to see who goes up, who goes down. Hopefully not anybody who goes off the list entirely, as in the cases of a death. But, you know, it's Game of Thrones. And even though this last episode was one of the first where no one died, like, in a long time. Hopefully, maybe we can continue that trend. I seriously doubt it, though, because the season's coming to a close. We've only got three more. Three more to see where everyone's gonna land and who can get to the closest to that Iron Throne. Anyways, thanks for watching. Please, please like or subscribe or downvote, honestly, if you don't think it's any good. But try to leave a comment. Maybe tell me how I could get better or how my rankings were way off, or how I'm crazy for putting Varys in the top, or Daenerys in the bottom, but whatever you guys want to say, go ahead, leave it in the comments down there. Thank you very much, I'm here at Movie Mammoth, and I'll be back soon for another update.